Hi, my name is Stuart Lynch, and this is the sixth and penultimate video in the revised Source Control with Xcode series. In this video, I want to take you through a scenario where we'll fork an open source repository from another GitHub user, and then we'll add a new feature. And then we'll submit a pull request to the maintainer of that source code and ask that they merge it back into their own project. If this is something you want to learn, then keep watching. I love getting your feedback, so tap the thumbs up button if you enjoyed this video and leave a comment below. Make sure you subscribe to the video and ring that bell to get notifications of new videos. And if you want to support my work, you can buy me a coffee. As your skills develop, you'll want to share and contribute what you know with others to make the Swift community bigger and better. Many people make their Git repositories public rather than private so that you can access those repositories and in many cases, collaborate with them on the project by creating issues or even contributing to the project by creating new features. These public projects that invite others to contribute are called open source projects. What I'd like to do with you in this video is to present a scenario where we can step through the different steps that are required to successfully make a contribution to an open source project. I suggest that you just watch this video and even take notes for yourself about the key steps that you have to go through. In the end, I'll provide you with a link to the completed project. Well, in order to create this video, I had to create a second GitHub account. And here it is. It's the Stuart Lynch demo account. And you can see that this user has no repositories. When I'm logged into GitHub, I see that my avatar here has the icon for that account. On this other tab here, you'll see that I'm looking at the repositories for my real GitHub account. And you are seeing that there are 187 different projects that I've made publicly available. The icon in the top right, though, shows that I'm still logged in as that demo account. Most of the projects are the completed source code to my videos, so that you can either download the zip versions or make clones. We've already seen how to do this in a previous video in this series. I'm interested, as the demo account, in this custom ratings app that we worked on in this series. So if I click on it, you see that I can get to the repository to clone it. The demo user really likes this repo, but would like to have a new feature. And that is the ability to add a custom image to be used for the ratings view. So he wants to communicate with the author so he can create an issue. So if he clicks on the Issues tab, he sees that there are no current issues for this repository. So he'll create a new one. And he's going to provide a title, which is Feature Request. And in the body, he can write what I just mentioned, that he wants to be able to upload his own images to use as the ratings icons. When he submits the rating, an email is sent to the project maintainer, and that is my real account. I'm using Gmail for this account here, so this is my list of mail. That new one is at the top. Now, if I were logged into GitHub right now as this user instead of the demo account, I could use this link to view it. I'm not, so behind the scenes here, let me just log off and back on to GitHub in my real Stuart Lynch account. Notice the icon change on the right? And you can see that the listing has 272 repositories instead of 187 because I, as the owner, have access to both public and private repositories. So let me open the custom ratings repo, and I see that one issue. Well, I can respond to this issue by suggesting that Demo here fork the project and try to build the feature himself and submit a pull request to merge it into the development branch. Well, when I respond, the Demo user gets an email. And this user uses an iCloud account. So I'm going to use Apple Mail here in Safari. And you can see that email here. Well, the demo user decides that this is a good thing to try. So let me log out of the GitHub for the real Stuart Lynch and back in as the demo user. Well, now that I'm logged back in as the demo user, I'll visit the real Stuart Lynch's GitHub account once again. And I'll go to the custom ratings repo and I'll click on the fork link. Notice that the tooltip tells me that I'm forking my own copy of Stuart Lynch's custom ratings. 
and I'm logged in here as the demo account, as you see. Well, I'll need to get the development branch, so I'm going to uncheck the copy the main branch only. Well, when I click on that link, it switches back to my demo account for Stuart Lynch demo and its GitHub page, and I see that I now have that repo as one of my repositories. And it's also telling me that it was forked from Stuart Lynch. Notice on GitHub that it is indicating that both branches are up to date with the original version. So what the demo user wants to do is to start working on a new feature. So he'll have to clone the repo. And to clone the repo, I'm going to use the GitHub clone command. So I'll need this HTTPS link for this. And then I can open a terminal application and change the directory to the desktop. And I'll use the git clone command and paste in that URL here and then return. And that will clone and download that project to my desktop. So let me open the project in Xcode. And if you've been following along with this series, it's pretty much where I left off. Notice, however, that there are two branches on the remote, but only one local branch. So because I want to work based on that development branch, I'll need to pull down the development branch to work on it. So all I have to do is switch to that branch, and it'll pull it down. Before I start modifying code, though, there's one thing I want to show you that might occur that you should be aware of. So on my desktop, this current ratings folder is the clone that the demo was working on. The original version is this Stuart's version. So let me open up the original version. Now, if I go to the source control navigator, I'm looking at that git history for the main branch, and I see that I did some refactoring, but I did not merge it with the development branch. So if the demo account's going to be working on that branch, I had better make sure that I update and merge it in. Now you can see that the development branch is one ahead of our remote, so I'll need to push that update to GitHub. Now this is only going to the real Stuart Lynch's repo, and it was after the demo account had forked the repo. So let's see what that means. Now I'm still logged in with the demo account for GitHub, and before I start coding, I just want to make sure that the development branch that I've cloned is up to date with not only this repo, but with the original. So let me switch to development. And if I refresh the page, I see that it's now telling me that the development is one commit behind the original. So what I need to do, and make sure that I always do this, is to sync the fork to update the branch. And this will synchronize it with the real repo for Stuart Lynch. Now I need to return to the demo's fork project and make sure I'm on the development branch. And let me switch to the ratings view to show you the difference when I do a pull. That refactor was to rearrange the ratings view a bit and add a second preview to demonstrate each of the two initializers that we already have. In order to update the code, I want to create a new branch from the development branch. So I'm going to create that new branch and I'm going to call it custom rating. And you can see that now this is the current branch so I can proceed to add my new features. Now the purpose of this video is to show you all about forking and pull requests. So I'm not going to go through in detail how I created this feature. Rather, I'm just going to update the two files and add a couple of image resources to the preview assets that demonstrate the new feature. And then I'll just go over quickly what happened. So the code's been updated, so let me show you what I've done. The preview for our first two initializers haven't changed, so that's good. This means that my existing code works without modification from the call sites. The third tab, though, is showing a custom image of a football as the image for the new ratings view. For those of you that are following the series from the start, let me quickly go through the changes. In the ratings view, I've added a new property for custom. That's an optional string. For the first, the symbol initializer, 
I can assign a value of nil to that custom. And then in the body of the view, for the for each loop, I'll create a group so that I can apply that on tap gesture to the if else clause that I have to create. So if there is a custom value, we can use an if let to unwrap it. And then check to see if there are two images in the asset folder, one with that custom name and another one with a dot fill extension. If so, I can create an image that will either be the unfilled or the filled version, depending on whether or not the looping rating is less than the current rating. If the images do not exist, I'll display a text view. Else, we just use what we had before for the other two initializers so our existing code won't break. In that second symbol, SF symbol initializer, again, I provide a nil value for the custom so that the initializer for that option will still work. And then I created a completely new initializer for the new type, where I ask for the custom name in the initializer, but I'll set the other two, the symbol and the symbol enum, to nil. And then I can also set the symbol string to an empty string because it's only used for those first two initializers. And then I can provide a new preview provider to display that new example. So that example works, I'll need to provide an image that is named football and one named football.fill. And I'll show you those in just a second. Back in content view, you can see that the original first three ratings views have not been changed. All I've done is add that new one for the football. So this demonstrates that the existing code still works and I have this new feature. And then in the assets folder for the preview, I see I've uploaded these two images. And both are rendered as template images and single scale so that we can resize them and apply a foreground style. So those are the changes that the original custom ratings view repository will see when I submit what's called a pull request. So first, the demo user needs to commit this to his project and then push it up to the forked version on GitHub. So we'll stage all, and then I'll provide a title for the feature, which is just added new custom image asset initializer. And then to provide as much information as I can, I'll add additional information in a description. Now this branch has never been created on the forked repo, so when I push it, I'm told that a new branch will be created. That's exactly what I want. If I switch back to GitHub now, I can see that I'm still logged in as that demo user. So let me refresh on this URL, and I can see the updates. We can see that there is a new branch that we can switch to. Next, then, the demo user can click on the compare and pull request. Now, the base repository that we'd like to merge into is not main on Stuart Lynch's repo. It's the development branch, as suggested. So let me do that, and now I can click on the Create Pull Request. GitHub will now perform a series of security and conflict checks. I see that there are no conflicts with the base branch, so that's great. And eventually, the security checks are complete. Now, if I open the real Stuart Lynch's email, that Gmail account, you can see that it says that a pull request has arrived. It lists the commit summary and the file changes that will be affected by the pull request. So let's log out of GitHub as the demo and back in as Stuart Lynch. Now let me open that custom ratings repo. And I can see that there is a pull request. The pull request analysis here is telling me that everything is okay, but I really do want to check first. So I can check on the commits, and I can go through each of the changes in a diff file to make sure that it all looks good. And it does. So I'm going to return to the pull request, 
and merge it. Now, as I was recording this, I was going to create a comment to go back to the demo user to read, but I forgot to log it. So instead, I went right ahead and just performed the merge. Now, if I bring up the iCloud mail account for the demo user, he's notified that a merge was completed. Now, let me go back to the original project in Xcode, because that's the original Stuart Lynch project. And I have to make sure that I pull down any changes that might be up on the GitHub repository. So let me pull it down to my local version here. And you can see the updates in the readings view now here in the development branch. So Stuart Lynch is satisfied with the results. So he can now go back to GitHub and the Issues tab and close the issue. And if I show you the demo accounts, email, the iCloud account, you'll see that he gets notification. Well, there's one last thing. I can log back in as the demo user to his GitHub account. And notice that his development branch is now two commits behind because Stuart Lynch, the real guy, he had done that pull requests, merge, and everything's been settled down there. So we need to sync up that fork one more time. And then the demo user can return to his Xcode version and switch to the development branch, which he never touched. Remember, he did all his work in the custom ratings branch. And once he switched to the development branch, he can pull the changes from his own local forked repository that is up to date. And at this point, he could choose to delete the custom rating branch both locally and on his remote branch, or he can leave it there for now as he might want to make some changes and make another pull request in the future. So that's it for this video. I hope that you now have a better understanding of the differences between cloning and forking and pushing and pulling from your own local remote as opposed to a pull request. I know that the terminology can be confusing at times. Now, if you're enjoying this series or just this video, I'd appreciate it if you left me a comment and gave it a thumbs up. And also subscribe to my channel as it'll drive more people to this in the future. Thanks so much for watching. There's only one more video in this series where we'll look at the GitHub desktop client.